there. So today we're joined by Emily Coyle, who's the Executive Director of the Canadian Association of Elizabeth Fry Societies. I know lots of people know who uh, this organization is and the good work they do, but um, Emily, thank you for joining me. You're doing such amazing work. Maybe you could just let us know um, exactly what you do or your organization does. Thank you, Pam, and thank you for having me. It is always a pleasure and an honor to speak with people who are interested in this work and supportive of the work that we do at the Canadian Association of Elizabeth Fry Societies, which I will refer to as CAFES occasionally for people who are watching. So we really have three pillars of work that we do. Um, and the, the work that we do revolves around working with women and girls and gender diverse folks who are criminalized. And the three pillars of work that we do are to build capacity, um, to defend prisoner rights, and to bring awareness to the issues. Uh, and within those three pillars, there's some really specific work that we do. So building the capacity of uh, the community to understand and to welcome people who are criminalized and support people who are criminalized. Um, and then build the capacity also of our government um, and our institutions to support and to understand the work that we do. And defending prisoners' rights is a whole other piece of work and a very important piece of work that we do. We have regional advocacy teams all across Canada who go into the federal uh, prisons that are designated for women and they monitor the conditions of confinement in those prisons in order to ensure that the human rights of the prisoners are upheld. Because uh, as most people may or may not know actually, I, I often assume that people know this, but when a person is um, convicted of a crime and is then sentenced to go into a federal prison, they don't lose their human rights. Uh, the sentence is to be separated from community and to be put into a prison. And so it's important that the human rights of prisoners are still upheld. Um, and, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in a second, but I just wanted to get to the last piece, um, which is raising awareness. And so we do a lot of work around um, with the media, the traditional media, social media, presentations, um, our annual report, gathering data, just to ensure that people are aware of the issues that we see and we think are important. And that's a segue back to what I wanted to talk about. So the issues that we see that are really important um, are the reasons why people become criminalized in the first place. And women, girls, and gender diverse folks have very specific reasons why they become criminalized. And they include, obviously, some gender-based violence, uh, unfortunately. Um, poverty is a huge issue that we see. Uh, addictions and mental health issues. So all of these contribute to a, a reasons why people would become criminalized in the first place and may end up in prison. Um, in addition to those issues that I've already highlighted, there are some large systemic issues like colonization, which impact Indigenous communities in Canada, and racism, you know, writ large, but that definitely impacts the Black community in Canada as well. And so these communities are over surveilled, uh, constantly under surveillance by our police, and end up being caught in, in situations where uh, others may not be and end up in prison uh, as well. And so we're looking at all those large issues and raising awareness to ensure that people know um, that these are these are huge societal issues that drive people uh, into um, our criminal justice system. And uh, prison is really almost the last step in our criminal justice system because you have um, the police, uh, the courts, um, sentencing, and then finally prison. And then as people go out onto parole, that would be probably one of the last, uh, and hopefully it doesn't become a cycle. Um, so, so, the, so I mentioned all those, those larger societal issues because these are human beings that are caught up in these larger societal issues who end up going to prison. And prison, for those of you who haven't been in prison, are pretty traumatic places. And for people who have experienced trauma throughout a lot of their lives, it is a continuation of the trauma that they would have experienced perhaps um, 
you know, in a foster home or um, as someone who is a gender diverse person and, you know, left home because they weren't supported by their family and ended up homeless. Um, you know, so these, these continuations of trauma do not serve, in our opinion, to, um, to meet the purpose that prisons are, are ostensibly designed for, which is to keep our public safe. And if we are going to put people who are traumatized um, by societal issues into further trauma by putting them in prison, we're not necessarily healing anything. And we're not coming to a place where we can help people to rehabilitate in community through a variety of solutions, which many have been proposed and I'm sure we'll get to. But that's the crux of the work that the Canadian Association of Elizabeth Fry Society does. Now, we are a member organization of 24 Elizabeth Fry societies who are on the ground in community who do the really important community work that is both preventative. Uh, so, you know, the upstream work that prevents people from becoming criminalized in the first place. So we have a lot of court support programs. We have um, Elizabeth Fry societies that run food banks that have uh, clothing uh, op options for people who don't have um, the money to buy clothes to go to school. We have a we have a, a variety and a, and you know there it's ever changing based on the needs of the local community, and these twenty four Elizabeth Fry societies also are instrumental in uh, supporting people when they come out of prison and providing the programming that is necessary um, for people to rehabilitate and to reintegrate back into community. I think you do such tremendous work and, and I've had the privilege of visiting uh, a number of, of institutes, Edmonton Institute for Women, as well as um, Buffalo Sage Healing Lodge in Edmonton. And I, I remember in particular at Buffalo Sage, one of the women said to me that it was the first time in her life that she was not just surviving, but she was healing. Um, you know, she, she and, and I met two women at the Edmonton Institute for Women, both of whom were in prison because of mandatory minimum sentences around drugs. They were living in poverty. They were with someone that was, um, you know, a male partner who was having them sell drugs on, on his behalf and got caught up in mandatory minimums. And one of them was sentenced the day after mandatory minimums for this sentence came into effect. And I, and I started to say to her, um, well, didn't your lawyer? And then I stopped myself and realized that, you know, if, if it had been me, I would have had a, a lawyer who would have tried to move the trial date earlier to avoid this, to give the judge discretion in sentencing. Um, she would have had a public defender and, and um, you know, out West, um, it's, we hear stats about the number of Indigenous women in prison, and I think the number is 30%, Emily, is that right? 30, 40? No, it's 42. 42. But, but the, the actual number is skewed lower because out West it's so high, and Indigenous women are the fastest growing prison population, but I think some of the prisons out West are probably 70 or 80% Indigenous women so it's it's a huge huge issue and there's very I, I think the public's perception about people who are in prison um, is different than the reality and any one of us could end up in prison if we had been faced with the same life circumstances that these women had faced throughout their life and you touched on a lot of it trauma uh, intergenerational trauma poverty addictions all of those things that if any, any of us were in that situation um, would likely have ended up in exactly the same situation that these women are in. And I don't think we do a good job of, of supporting them when they do get into the criminal justice system while they're in prison to give them the skills they need to succeed when they're released and also supporting them when they're released from prison. So um, maybe you could talk about some of the things that maybe we, we, we should be working towards doing to support these women. I know that's yeah. a long list. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I, I think I've, I started talking about it when I mentioned upstream. And I think that is really key because I'd like us to focus on shrinking prisons out of existence. And that is not a deficit model, but rather um, a model that looks at building robust, responsive communities so that everybody who's in that community matters and can find what they need. And, and that's a, a large sort of 
pronouncement to make. And but what that looks practically on the ground is, you know, people have enough food to eat. Um, they're not looking for their next meal. People have a home to live in. Um, people have enough money to live. Um, people are able to find work. Uh, people can find childcare. Um, you know, if if perhaps they become addicted, they're they're able to find addiction services that are supportive addiction services that are based on a harm reduction model. Um, so so there's just a number of ways that we can build these communities to ensure that people aren't um, you know, falling into the kinds of um, necessary uh, choices that people end up making to survive. And you know, this is not everyone that's in prison, but it's most of the people that we see. And I would be remiss if I didn't say that we really need to think about mental health supports. Um, a lot of the people that we see in prison have mental health health uh, issues uh, are not well um, and prison environments exacerbate their mental health issues and unfortunately the prison is um, you know in, in a lot of ways the, the law is a blunt instrument to to respond to someone's mental health suffering right um, yeah and on on that on mental health for women in particular in prison um, I remember hearing, I think it's 20 beds for women, forensic beds for mental health. And women, I know one of the recommendations out of our reports uh, last year at Status of Women or last parliament was to stop sending women to male treatment centers. Um, they're, they're just, there's, it, it's under-resourced in the entire prison system, but in particular for women, I think the resources uh, mental health resources are grossly inadequate in in the prison system for women. They really are, and and we don't have enough people who are trained to understand and respond with empathy when someone is having mental health issues in the prison. And often the response is to put them into segregation or segregation like conditions. Um, so that they don't hurt themselves, which is the, the response that, that we are given when we ask why someone was put into segregation-like conditions. And what that does to a person who has existing mental health issues is that it, it really amounts to torturing them if, they're, you know, um, if there's a mental health break that has happened. Um, so I think that that is something that we really need to pay attention to and think about when we're creating these robust communities. And that's where uh, Elizabeth Fry's across the country are already doing so much work. I mean, there are, there are ha there's, half there's halfway houses that are run by Elizabeth Fry societies. There's second stage housing that's run by Elizabeth Fry societies. There's, there's housing opportunities for people who um, need affordable housing beyond second stage housing in many of our uh, locals as well. And in just talking to some of the executive directors yesterday at our monthly executive director meeting, um, some of the issues that we may not think about, like how am I going to get from a prison to my home community if there is no bus that runs? And we know uh, in Saskatchewan recently, uh, a young mom, um, Kimberly Squirrel, was found dead. Uh, unfortunately, she had um, frozen to death and really brings home how an issue like transportation is often unseen by people uh, who have vehicles or who have access, you know, in an urban center to, to, um, to buses or, or LRTs or, you know, and, and we were talking about how one of the ways that the Elizabeth Fry locals are, are solving that is by getting vans and actually getting in the and driving people, you know, really practical solutions. And I think those are the kinds of things that we need to look at to build these robust communities. However, once people get into prison um, and they're, they're in prison under interesting circumstances right now because of COVID, um, it has meant that the same programming schedule that was available pre-COVID is not currently available to people, which is um, Im impacting release dates for a lot of the folks that we work with. Um, and that has meant that um, 
the there may be two, I was looking at the Office of the Correctional Investigator, who's the ombudsperson uh, for the prison system in Canada, just came out with a third status report on COVID-19 in the prisons. And one of the things that he mentioned was that on average now people are being delayed in their release by about two to three months, which is a long time when you're sitting in prison. Uh, and, and so those programs, which are necessary for people to complete to get out, are, is one thing that we need to um, ensure. And when you talk about programs, these are ones yeah. the parole board looks for, for them to have completed prior to release, right? So, exactly. so, so they, they just, it's impossible for them to be released until they do the programs, but the programs aren't offers because of COVID. So yeah. they're in a, a catch-22 where they can't do the program, so they can't be released and, and um, it, it just extends their stay and, and uh, it, it's not, it's not, it doesn't do anyone any service. It doesn't enhance public safety in any way. Um, and, and it's, it's, it's a huge, huge issue. I remember um, hearing from parole officers about challenges with people not having ID when they leave prison. So you're, you, you, can't get a, you can't get a job, you can't get a, a place to live. You, you, so many things require us to have identification. And when you leave prison, you don't have it. Um, and so, you know, it can take six months to get your, your new ID. And in the meantime, you're in limbo. Um, something that we just take for granted, right? That, oh, well, you know, why is why is someone facing challenges when they're released? He compared to to it to be like, like a stool, and removing you know one of the legs is housing, one of the legs is employment, and you take the legs of the stool away, and of course that person is going to fall. And if, you know, like we're we're setting them up for failure. The fact that so many people do um, succeed when they leave prison, and the vast majority do. Um, it's, I, I think they do it in spite of the system, not because of the system. And they do it because of their own resilience. And they do it because of organizations like yours uh, that are supporting them when they're released. I think that's a really good point, actually, that uh, the resilience piece. And so many of the folks that we um, work with are extremely resilient and malleable and um, not malleable, um, creative in ways to 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 stay alive and to survive and that's really remarkable and speaking just this morning with someone who has spent some time in a federal institution she's been out for the last seven years she said one of the one of the changes for her um, in her life was when the regional advocates from our organization went into the prison where she was and sat with her and believed her. And for a lot of people in the prison, they have stories, they will tell you, but because of the stigma of, of criminalization, um, there is you know, a, a real lack of belief when it comes to the things that people are telling you about their situations and their stories. And it takes a long time for people to understand that they in fact, are worthy of love. And, you know, I, I know that that's not something that we talk about a lot in professional situations, but, but love is really important when we're dealing with other human beings. And so, you know, the regional advocates went into the prison, met with her, um, taught her about her human rights. We have a booklet that uh, I have actually here on my desk, which is being revised, but this is the old one. It's called Human Rights in Action. And it was um, created in, oh, a long time ago, 2012. Um, and it really details all of the laws that apply to the people who are in prison and the ways that they that it, that it applies to them and remedies they can seek if, they're, if their human rights have been violated in some way in prison. And, and speaking to your point about ID, we have a new project right now at the CAPE's head office called Breaking the Cycle. And that, project was funded through women and gender uh, equality here in Canada. And they, they have funded us to build a follow-up um, booklet. And so essentially what we're going to do is put into this uh, booklet, preparing for release, which happens the moment that a person steps into prison. 
uh, as you mentioned, you know, you have to do programs, you have to talk to your PO, you have to apply for, for temporary absences, whatever your plan says. So you prepare for release from, from the moment you walk into prison. And then once you're released, what are the kinds of things that you need to know for you to get out and start to live your life again? And so we have in the Breaking the Cycle Handbook, um, where do I go to find ID? ID? <laughs> you know, where do I go to find a job? Uh, which of course is really difficult for people with a criminal record. And so mm -hmm. we say to people, you need to go out and you need to work and you need to rehabilitate, but nobody's gonna hire you because they're gonna ask you if you have a criminal record. And so, you know, there's all these catch 22s like we've mentioned yeah. earlier that are really set up to, to, um, to, to prevent someone from, from succeeding. So you're right, it is often in spite of the systems that are in place that people do succeed. Well, um, I can't thank you enough. Um, not just for, I mean, we, we, we could probably talk for hours and hours and hours. <laughs> we could. I and, know. And, I'd, and I'd love to, I'd love to do another one with you and maybe we can delve into specific issues that, that women face in, in prison and outside of prison and to, to keep them out of prison because there are just so many. Um, I mean, that's the ideal situation is that we just prevent, prevent these women from, um, coming in contact with the criminal justice system in the first place. Um, and I also think it's important for people to know that men's and women's institutions are very, very, very different. And we often, we lump the two together and make generalized statements about prison and pr prisoners. And, and really we need to be um, talking about men's prisons and women's prisons and, and, and differentiating those two because they are very different and they're, they're um, you know that that gender component is is extremely important in 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 things like programmings, how we treat people, what brings them into contact with the criminal justice system in the first place. So, if people wanted to get more information about um, Elizabeth Fry, how would they do that? Our website is really great. We've recently updated it, so it's um, the Canadian Association of Elizabeth Fry Society is the acronym C A E F S dot C A. Um, so if you go to that website, you'll find our contact information, you'll find information about all the work that we do, including any press releases we've done, statements we've made in the past year, um, all of our annual reports going back many years. Um, and if there's more that people want to know, there's our, our contact information right on the website and they can be in touch with us. Yeah, and you've done some terrific reports too on, on things like strip searches and um, it's the first one that comes to mind. But even uh, I know you've recently uh, made comment about the um, the criminal justice reform bill that Minister Lametti introduced. So there's lots of resources, lots of information on your work. So uh, thank you so much for for yeah. this this. Uh, I feels like it's very short but informative uh, chat. I'm very appreciative. Thank you. <laughs>